The worst moments were at the beginning. We didn't have much information about the enemy. We didn't know if they were 1,000, 3,000 or 10,000. We didn't know what types of weapons they might have. We didn't know if this was a total invasion. Without American air support or resupply, the invasion force was outnumbered and outgunned. Within 72 hours, the invaders were either captured or dead. I did not realize that the mission was impossible until the last day, almost at the end. We trusted in our allies. We never thought they would forsake us or abandon us. We didn't think that they could betray the commitment they had with us. Jack Kennedy was devastated by the fiasco at the Bay of Pigs, and he said it was a fiasco. He was not accustomed to failure in politics or in life. And he was more distraught than I'd ever seen him. How could I have been so stupid, he said. Castro had survived and humiliated Kennedy. The CIA was told to think again. Our job was to start to come up with new plans, not a Bay of Pigs type plans, but new plans to, quote, get rid of Castro and the Castro regime, unquote. Everything was suggested, from assassination to spraying LSD into a television studio to make it seem as if Fidel had gone mad. Whatever they tried, Castro took in his stride. More secure within his own country, he sought to export revolution to the rest of Latin America. Alarmed by this prospect, America kept up the pressure on Castro. In the spring of 1962, a practice invasion of a Caribbean island was mounted by 40,000 American Marines. We did that purposely to make Castro pay more attention to that than causing trouble in Latin and Central America. But the Cubans and the Russians, they told us later, believed that the United States really did intend to uh, attack Cuba, and therefore Castro kept saying, I need some help. Castro's pleas inspired the Soviet leader, Khrushchev, to make a daring offer. He had boasted to the world of Russia's nuclear strength, but in reality, he knew just how limited his long-range missile force really was. But he did have medium-range nuclear missiles. From the territory of the Soviet Union, they couldn't possibly reach the territory of the USA. But deployed on Cuba, they would become strategic nuclear weapons. That meant, in practical terms, we had a chance to narrow the differences between our forces. I immediately appreciated the strategic importance of the presence of those missiles in Cuba. By that time, the Americans had already transported similar missiles to Turkey. I thought, if we expected the Soviets to fight on our behalf, to run risks for us, and even involve themselves in a war for our sake, it would be immoral and cowardly on our part to refuse to accept the presence of those missiles here. In July 1962, under the nose of the Americans, the first of 150 Soviet ships, loaded with heavily disguised nuclear missiles and over 40,000 troops, sailed for Cuba. 
И американцы и это прозевали. Они не поняли и не увидели. The Americans just didn't notice that we managed to deliver not one, but 43,000 people there. Plus the equipment, weapons, and everything necessary for the installation work. We put all the cars, trucks, and tractors on the top. All the military equipment was hidden under the decks. CIA agents in Cuba reported that Russian troops and missile trailers had been seen in the streets of Havana. Washington dismissed the reports as rumor. I saw those weird weapons, and then I said to my friend Pablo, Pablo, how powerful are these weird weapons? And he answered, these are nuclear missiles. So I thought, oh, really powerful. They just put them here, out in the open. But the CIA had noticed the increase in Soviet ships heading for Cuba. On October the 14th, a U-2 spy plane was ordered to fly across the island to try to discover what was going on. The next morning, the Photographic Interpretation Center in Washington started analyzing the pictures that the U-2 had taken. We're looking at the photography and we spot objects that are foreign to the environment. And we kept looking and we said, oh, oh uh, this is an SS-4 ballistic missile site. So working with the photo interpreters, uh, we became convinced that this was it. The Soviets had never put any nuclear weapons outside the Soviet borders. And uh, we didn't think they'd do it, you know. Um, well, the, the truth of the matter is, it, it never dawned on us that they would take that kind of risk. At 8.45 a.m. on October the 16th, the CIA informed Kennedy that without any doubt, there were Soviet missiles in Cuba. The president called his advisors to the White House. We didn't spend a great deal of time wondering why the Soviets were doing this, because why they had done it, for whatever reason they had done it, they had done it in a surreptitious way, lying to the United States uh, through a variety of uh, messages and messengers that they were only putting defensive weapons uh, into Cuba. And those weapons uh, constituted a clear and present danger to our security. The missiles in Cuba made the Americans more vulnerable than ever before. The Russians were so close, they could strike without warning. The first strike would have knocked out all the American air bases, bomber bases, all the American missile bases, and all American cities except Seattle, which was out of their range. But Washington, D.C., New York City, Dallas would have all gone under the hammer. Uh, we talked about the possibility of an airstrike, which was, at one time or another, almost everybody's uh, first choice upon first thought to knock out the missiles. We talked about an invasion of uh, Cuba, which was always the preferred choice of the right wing, go in and take Cuba away from Castro and rid the island of communism while at the same time getting rid of these missiles. A diplomatic approach, either bilaterally or through the United Nations. A blockade or quarantine, as it later came to be called. No decision was made at that uh, first meeting. But if a vote had been taken there, airstrike was probably number one on everybody's list. Robert Kennedy, the president's brother and closest advisor, became concerned that if America's might was used without warning against a small island, world opinion would turn against them. Robert Kennedy, rightfully in my opinion, drew the analogy uh, that it would be regarded by the world as a bombing of Cuba, of bases in Cuba, comparable to the bombing of uh, Pearl Harbor by uh, the Japanese uh, in uh, 1941. And he said, uh, I don't think I uh, want my brother to uh, become another Tojo. As the arguments continued, 
the Soviet foreign minister, Andrei Gromyko, and the Soviet ambassador, Anatoly Dobrynin, kept a long-standing engagement at the White House. The president raised the question of the increasing tension between our two countries in connection with the Soviet deliveries of weapons. The president said, we're worried about it because it's connected with our own safety and security. Gromyko told him, just as I was told to say, that all our deliveries, Mr. President, are of a defensive nature. If you don't intend to invade Cuba, you shouldn't worry, because all the weapons are defensive. It was a clear intent to deceive. If the, the U.S. were not to respond to Soviet deception, how would this influence the attitude of our NATO allies? How would they view the U.S. guarantee of their security? And how would it influence the future behavior of the Soviet Union? If they got by with deception once, couldn't they do it again? For the next two days, Kennedy stayed away, keeping up with a congressional election campaign. In Washington, his advisors tried to come up with a solution. There were no good solutions. Every solution was full of holes and risks. It was the only time during my three years in the White House that I would wake up in the middle of the night agonizing over what was the right approach.